When the GI Bill was created in 1944, the goal was to reward veterans for their service to the country. And millions did benefit, getting help to buy homes and pay for their education. But many of the 1.8 million black American veterans who fought in World War II in Korea did not. A recent Boston Globe op-ed declared it was one of the worst racial injustices of the 20th century. Joining me now to discuss are the authors of that Globe piece. Linda Bilmes is a former Assistant Secretary of the U.S. Department of Commerce. Cornell William Brooks is the former president of the NAACP, and they're both now at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. It's great to see you both. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Linda, you write that more than 4 million veterans were able to buy a home because of the GI Bill. More than 8 million benefited in terms of their education. How many black American veterans were in that number? Well, there were very few, few black Americans who were able to benefit from this. Uh, we don't know exactly how few, but it, it was a tiny number. So, for example, in a survey uh, in New York and New Jersey of 60,000 mortgages, there were only fewer than 100 uh, that were awarded to black veterans. And this is despite the fact that blacks actually were 10% of the armed forces during Korea and 8% during World War II. You know, what was significant about that number that struck out to me, uh, Linda, is uh, my uh, sort of mindless assumption before I read your piece is most of that housing discrimination would be in southern states, but obviously New York and New Jersey don't fall into that category. Colonel, why and how were black veterans excluded from all the benefits of the GI Bill? Mm. Well, these programs were administered um, at the state level, and so the state actors had the opportunity to engage in discrimination. So if you think about, just to paint a picture, Dory Miller, who was at Pearl Harbor, uh, a tall black man who was trained as a cook. And when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, he literally got behind a machine gun, though he was untrained, and shot down as many as four planes. He then, he survived that battle, went into another battle, and subsequently lost his life. But had he returned to his home in the Deep South, uh, local officials would not have allowed him to use his benefits to purchase a home. I uh, would not have allowed him to use uh, those benefits to even go to a college other than a historically black college or university. So Linda's what, what Linda's describing, what we are describing here is a near blanket exclusion from housing benefits and education benefits. And by the way, and, and the housing exclusion in the northern states was a, a function, I'm assuming, of what most people, I think, watching the show know about is redlining, no? Uh, that's right. So, so it really was almost impossible f to get a loan um, for a black person because of what was called redlining. There were just a small number of areas where blacks were able to purchase homes. So in this case, even if a black veteran qualified for a VA backed loan. That means that the government was paying for the, was backing and guaranteeing the loan. The lenders wouldn't lend them the money. So they couldn't get a mortgage. And that pretty much happened across the country, not only in Southern states. Cornell, your, your goal I know in this work is not just to correct the history which you've done, but ad address the discrimination. How does one address it? Well, there is legislation in Congress, uh, as we speak, sponsored by Senator Raphael Warnock, uh, Representative Seth Moulton, and Representative James Clyburn, that would take the benefits denied to these veterans and extend them to their descendants, which is what the, the VA, I should say, what the GI Bill does currently. And why is that critically important? It's critically important is because not only were these veterans denied these benefits, but their families. In other words, to the extent that they weren't able to buy houses, they weren't able to pass those houses to their children, yeah. use those houses to support businesses, to send children to college. And this contributes to uh, the racial wealth gap, the housing wealth gap. So we have legislation in Congress that would actually address this historical wrong. Cornell, that legislation is named after Sergeant Isaac Woodard and Sergeant Joseph Maddox. Could you tell people who they were? So, uh, Sergeant Woodard was a uh, black man who served abroad, who, uh, who served honorably, who was recognized uh, for his service, who returned to the state of South Carolina. And literally on the day he was he returned in his uniform, a uh, local uh, 
sheriff uh, blinded him. And this was such a racial atrocity, it led to the desegregation yeah. of the military under, under uh, President Truman. And the other serviceman was a uh, veteran who applied and was admitted to graduate school at Harvard, but who was denied the opportunity to go to Harvard as a consequence of local officials who did not want to set a precedent. By the way, a couple of years ago, I had a judge who was the judge in the case of the guy who murdered the nine people in that beautiful church in Charleston. He wrote an incredible book about Sergeant Woodard called Unexampled Courage. I don't know if either of you have read it, but it is really, it is stunning, and I'd, I'd recommend it. You know, Linda, not just this piece, I know you two have been working for a bit on restorative justice issues, on r reparations. And I know we have a president who I think may be the first who supports a commission to study the issues. I know that's pending before Congress too. Is the attitude about at least studying and discussing restorative justice, is there, have minds been cracked open or have we gotten, have we made very little progress? Well, I think that one of the issues that hasn't been considered is the fact that we actually pay reparatory compensation for a really wide range of harms in society. We pay reparatory compensation for people who have been harmed um, by, by vaccine injuries, people yeah. who have been harmed by exposure to pesticides, toxins, radiation. We guarantee uh, benefits in terms of flood insurance, farm insurance, agricultural insurance. We take care of a wide range of people as a kind of social norm. And so as we think about this issue, uh, we need to consider this in the context of the social norm of this country, which is a generous country, in that it tries to provide some form of compensation for people whose livelihood has been um, harmed in some way. But have those facts cracked open the minds of people where they were closed heretofore, Linda, or no? Well, I mean, I think that the, the I think that the attitudes are changing. Young people have a very, very different attitude toward and a yeah. greater enthusiasm and openness toward this issue than uh, people did a generation ago. You know, Cornell William Brooks, before you go, last time you were here, uh, I'm mm -hmm. sure the audience remembers, I think you were in the last day of your hunger strike leading up to what the hope was that uh, Congress would uh, be part of the good side of history and pass mm -hmm. voting rights legislation. They did not. Do you, a month or so later, see any light at the end of any tunnel on the voting rights front? Um, I'm always hopeful. And part of the reason why I'm hopeful is as we speak, we have members of the 82nd Airborne, a large number of whom are black. That's the same uh, unit of the army that my brother served with. These are folks in Ukraine as we speak serving our country. Again, a demonstration of commitment, a demonstration of patriotism. I'd like to believe when those vets come back in the same way in the, in the 1940s, uh, when blacks returned to this country, that ignited the civil rights movement and it led for a push to this country to right historical wrongs. So I'd like to believe that when these veterans serve ably abroad as they've done over the generations, that this country will be reminded that we can't preach democracy abroad mm. if we don't practice it at home. Cornell William Brooks, Linda Vilmas, I hope you'll join me again to continue this conversation. I really appreciate it tonight. Thank, Thank you. you.